Welcome to the Spiegel Law Firm podcast, where we help people who've been fired or afraid they might be, and we discuss cutting edge legal issues in the news. I'm Tom Spiegel, founder of the law firm, and today I have one of my Cracker Jack attorneys with me, Zachary Amon. We're glad to have him back. As usual, he's going to be uh, using a sports analogy to explain some uh, complex legal topics. Um, and we're going to be talking about the Chevron Doctrine, and you're going to learn about what that is by the time we get to the end of this and why you should care. And just a little bit of a spoiler alert, there was a Supreme Court case uh, just in the past month or so that overturned the Chevron Doctrine, which is about uh, half a century worth of precedent on how we uh, deal with federal agencies. But before we do that, a little bit of legalese. Uh, this podcast is not intended as legal advice to you. It is for educational purposes, nor does it create an uh, attorney-client relationship with our firm. If you want either of those things and you've got it, you should hire a lawyer. And with that, Zach, welcome. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we'll get right into it. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching soccer on TV. And um, there was an instance where the referee had to use the VAR system, which is the video assisted referee, um, to determine if there was a penalty. Uh, you know, and it's, it's similar in other sports, too, where you have the idea of the coach's challenge, right? And where that is, is uh, the referee makes a call, the coach will issue a challenge, they go to the instant review. Uh, it's usually done by uh, some somebody off site. Uh, you know, I know in the NBA, they say, we're going to go to Secaucus, New Jersey, because that's where the replay. Uh, uh, monitoring system is is housed, but uh, what happens is you know the referee will make that that in game decision, and then you go to the monitor for review. And in order to overturn a call, typically the standard is it has to be clear and convincing evidence that the call should be overturned. So uh, in other words, the the referee's initial call enjoys some level of deference. So if it's not clear that it should be overturned, it usually stands. Uh, you know, you have you have where it's the call is confirmed, the call stands, or the call is overturned. Is generally how it goes, at least uh, NBA and, or, or in football as well. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to real quick, just for yeah, yeah. for reference of like, uh, you know, there are three three broad evidentiary uh, standards in law. Uh, one is called the preponderance of the evidence, and if you think about that, as the scales of justice. Preponderance is just fifty one percent. Got to prove something by a preponderance. Just got to prove prove fifty one percent. Everyone's familiar with criminal law, where it's clear and where it's uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? You got a you big big hurdle that the prosecution has to to surmount in order to get a conviction. Clear and convincing is sort of in the middle. So you got to have more than a preponderance. You don't have to have to have quite the beyond a reasonable doubt, but you got to have clear and convincing evidence. So just as a reverence for folks, right? That, that's exactly right. And, and so then we turn to, as you alluded to in the beginning, uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago with the Supreme Court. Uh, so the Supreme Court, their term ends uh, in, during the summer. So we're towards the end of their term. They're churning out opinions. Uh, and so several opinions are, are released per day. But one that we want to talk about today is the Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo decision. So as a little background for that case, uh, that case centers on a challenge that the local bright enterprises uh, the company, it's a, a fishery, challenged the authority of the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, on, on a rule. And the case was brought by the company. It contested a rule that required fishing vessels to have to pay for um, monitors on the boat. So th these monitors would go, they're independent observers that go and make sure that uh, the vessels are compliant with federal regulations. The National Marine Fisheries Service made that rule. It was challenged in court. And uh, Loper Bright actually lost in the lower courts because of the, the idea of this Chevron deference. So what is Chevron deference? What does that mean? Uh, and it comes from a 1984 case, like you said, about 50 years ago, um, Chevron USA versus the Natural Re Resources Defense Council. Uh, we won't go into the details of the case specifically, but the doctrine addresses how courts should treat interpretations of statute made by these administrative agencies. So in practice, what happens when a court reviews an agency's interpretation of a statute that it's responsible for administering, the court would follow a two-step process. Uh, the first thing it would do is it would look and see if the statute was was clear on the issue. So if Congress had enacted the statute, it was unambiguous as to what was supposed to happen. 
if the statute was clear, then the court had to give effect to that un- unambiguous um, intent that Congress gave it. That's the simplest version. Uh, now, if the statute is ambiguous or it's just silent on a specific issue, then the court has to ask whether the agency's interpretation was reasonable. Uh, if it is, the court would defer to that agency's interpretation, um, even if the court might have interpreted it differently. And the idea for that is that agencies, you know, they have their experts. They have people who are, this is their job, is to get into the nitty gritty technical details in their specific areas. And so the court reasoned that, the, that those experts were in a better position to make informed decisions on those types of issues. The deference there just recognized that expertise. The idea was to create more consistent um, and predictable regulations for its various industries. Uh, it was a really powerful thing for the agencies because it, it empowered them uh, by giving them more leeway to interpret those vague statutes, which in, ter- in turn affects how laws are implemented and how they're enforced. Uh, particularly uh, if you look at how Congress makes a law. You know, there are some times where ambiguities are part of the package. They're built in by design, and that's either to secure enough votes to pass the law in the first place, or because they recognize that the agencies would employ these experts to really understand the nitty gritty and get into how to enforce things. So they were kind of like, let's leave the little details there. So the Loper Bright case changes all of that. Um, In the case, the Supreme Court actually overturned uh, the idea of Chevron deference. And so uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote that Chevron deference actually conflicted with the Administrative Procedures Act because the APA contemplated those ambiguities would actually be resolved by courts and not the administrative bodies, not the experts. Um, Several other justices, they filed concurrences uh, that that presented Chevron deference as a separation of powers issues. Um, So the idea is that the courts are responsible for interpreting the law and not these administrative agencies, which are technically under the executive branch. So what does that mean for us? Uh, and what does that mean generally for, for, for our listeners? You know, it could mean nothing. It could mean that nothing changes. Um, the Chief Justice wrote that this did not overturn any of the prior decisions that were made using Chevron deference. But I'm going to suspect that there's probably going to be more challenges made based on new rules that come out. Uh, from these agencies and where it affects us in particular, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the National Labor Relations Board, the Federal Labor Relations Authority. uh, That's just to name a few. Um, Another recent Supreme Court decision around the same time uh, is a corner, the the company there was called the Corner Post um, Incorporated. Um, It changes the statute of limitations for challenging rules um, that are made from administrative agencies. It used to be where it was six years from the time the rule was implemented. Now it's six years from the time that it affects a company. So, you know, I've, I can envision a scenario where a company is created purely to challenge uh, a rule or regulation that, it, that constrains it now that Chevron's been overturned. So a lot of really big things that could be coming down the pike. Again, it's, it's so soon now to really understand how it will go. But there's been a lot of speculation on which way it could go. And I think either way it goes, it means a lot of changes are coming. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Very uh, an excellent summary. Yeah, and for, for our listeners, you know, Chevron is probably not something that you've heard of. Uh, and the question is, how does it affect my day-to-day life? And you're, you're right. I mean, I think it's going to have a big effect on, you know, particular employment law. The things like the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, you know, Department of Labor, those kinds of agencies that you mentioned is going to constrain their power. I don't know. Oh, I'll give you one example. Just recently, Congress passed um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which allowed women who are in the workplace to get accommodations to deal with pregnancy related issues. And the statute talks about pregnancy related complications or pregnancy related conditions. And the question was, does that include abortion services? And the EEOC said, yes, it does, um, you know, because it's our job to interpret the statute. And this is how the Title VII has been interpreted. So we are going to find that it does, in, while the, the statute itself doesn't explicitly say, spell this out, 
that abortion is a pregnancy related condition. And that's, you know, one can certainly make that argument. It was challenged in court in Texas. Uh, the Texas granted court granted an injunction. So it has limited effect, at least for abortion related services there. But that's just an example of the kind of uh, challenges we'll see to administrative agency reaches. As for the individual litigant, you know, if you filed a charge with the EEOC, um, I don't know how much effect it's going to have on you. I mean, clearly, you know, uh, the EEOC might have a tougher time finding, you know, in favor of somebody who was fired for uh, seeking an abortion under the, you know, Private Workers Fairness Act, for instance. But in large part, that kind of quasi judicial, uh, you know, just judicial function, I think will continue, at least for the EEOC. Um, it may not have a tremendous impact on the ground, but in terms of policy reaches, like you just talked about, going to make a big difference. And I think it's going to make a big difference for all of us. All of these industries now, you know, are going to have um, more an easier time of challenging these federal uh, agencies. And this has been, you know, Chevron has been, as you know, Zach, been under fire for years. It tends That's to true. break down on conservative and liberal lines, conservative scholars and politicians don't like it. They, they don't like government generally, and they see this as a government overreach. Um, and they've won this battle. So it will be interesting to see. I mean, it's a big power grab by the courts because now they're going to, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, right? Because the whole, as you, as you point out, the whole reason for having an administrative agency do this is because they've got the technical expertise. Well, does a court, you know, I mean, the, you know, courts have very small staffs. They don't, they don't have, they don't have like, Think about a you know a, a court that's trying to interpret a, a nuclear energy regulation. I mean, they're going to have to rely on the litigants to spell that out for them. But your average judge, I certainly don't, is not going to be able to understand the technical aspects of that. So then, for Congress, Congress is going to have to deal with ambiguity or risk that ambiguity in a law that it passes is going to be you know ultimately interpreted by the courts. The Congress is going to have to you know be much more explicit about. Um, you know, the acts that it passes. So I saw some speculation is Congress now going to have to beef up it, its ranks of staff with expertise. I mean, Congress, more than judges, already does have, you know, each member has their own staff. Each committee has its own more specialized staff, but they might even need to be more than that because they're not going to be able to rely on, you know, these agencies to interpret it. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it sort of depends on, you know, which side of that spectrum that you fall on, but it's going to have big impacts, as you mentioned, on all of us. That was an excellent explanation of it. And as you said, for the sports angle, for the for the VAR, that's exactly right. Now there's no, right, the, the, the ref on the field doesn't get the, doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. Like the person looking at that VAR, in this case, the courts, is going to be a look at it anew and make their own decisions. So uh, it's going to have a far-reaching effect. Um, it's going to have a big impact on employment law. And like you said, it's going to be this is going to be litigated for years to come. Right. I, I, I agree. I think, you know, it may not have any immediate impacts, but, I you know, I see challenges to this probably happening almost immediately. Uh, well, not happening challenges to this particular uh, outcome, but challenges now based on what this outcome says. And I think, you know, the majority did try to anticipate that idea of, well, now everything has changed. And they said, you know, it's ultimately up to the court's uh, determination, but they can rely on amicus briefs. They can rely on the, the, the litigants to, to uh, supply them with the information that they know. And, you know, I think a good faith effort on that is, is probably a good thing. Um, but again, having a, a judge read you know, a, a brief from either the litigants, which would obviously be slanted one way or another, um, because that's what litigation is all about. Um, having a, a judge read a brief, an amicus brief from, uh, you know, an industry uh, expert is probably going to be helpful. But then again, you have to think about if there's any slanting in is that as well, um, where maybe that's not necessarily the case under Chevron because the experts uh, you know, I, you know, there's probably the argument the experts might have a slant based on what administration is currently in power at the time, which is I, I, I hear you on that. But I think, you know, in those cases, whenever they have the time to do the research to to go into what makes a rule or regulation rather than um, look reactively to uh, litigation, I think that there's a lot more time and a lot 
a lot less pressure to quote unquote get it right because it's you're making the rule rather than interpreting uh, or potentially overturning it with high stakes all around. But I, I, I do I, I do hear that there have been several cases in the Supreme Court uh, this term where they essentially said we might not agree with this decision, but this is what the law says, and if you want to change, Congress has to do it. So a lot of pushback on 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 Congress this term and saying, Congress, do your jobs, get things done. If 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 laws need to be changed, you need to amend them. And that's not and the courts say that's not our job. Our job is to interpret and that's what the law says. Whether yeah. whether that happens or not, I don't know. But yeah, <laughs> we'll, I we'll think that's see. right. It's gonna like you said, it's gonna be spooled out over years and perhaps decades to come. And I, I don't, you know, wanna overplay this is a big decision, absolutely. But Chevron has been under attack for years. Uh, you know, conservatives have been gunning for it uh, in the courts with some success. So its reach has been whittled down. And we've certainly seen courts who, um, you know, even if they are, they are in some sense granting deference, they're not shy about overturning agency regulations. So, you know, this has been a process that's been hap happening for some time. And, I, you know, I don't, you know, I want to look at it completely through uh, uh, political terms because it's not just about that. But there, I mean, I have colleagues who are on the on the 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 left end of the spectrum who are immigration lawyers, and they were thrilled the Chevron was overturned because they're sick of, in their view, of dealing with you know sort of these um, agency figures who, in their mind, are are you know kind of power hungry and difficult to get around and. So I, it, you know, both as a policy matter and as a legal matter, this one's going to be playing out for for some time. It's going to have a big effect, but like you said, how this kind of kind of resets that to use your sports analogy, the the, the goal lines um, is you know a bit of speculation at this point, but but it's it's one to watch. It's gonna it's gonna be. As you know, Zach, having just uh, recently been in law school, this is going to be one the law students are going to be right, going to be struggling with for a long time as as uh, as opinions come down. But a very exciting, very exciting topic. I appreciate you catching us up to speed on it. Of course, of course. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna let you say jump off. I'm gonna say goodbye to our listeners, and we'll catch you on the on the next time. All right, sounds great. Have a good All one. Right. Bye, Zach. Well, thanks for joining this episode today, where we learned about Chevron and and Zach's very helpful analogy, the sports analogy and the video replay. Um, I hope you got something out of this. If you like this sort of topic, feel free to forward this to a family member or a friend, I'm trying to get this word out to as many people as possible. You can also go to our site, thecareerrocket.io and give us your email address and we will send you the latest and greatest on employment law every week. And finally, you can go to our website, spigalaw.com where we have a lot of uh, no cost information and it leads to links to our various social media channels where we also share a lot of no cost information designed to educate folks with employment law issues hope you found this helpful until next time take care mm -hmm.